let's take a look at this problem. So we have a refrigeration with two evaporators and one condenser. The wording of the problem is as it, you have refrigerant 134A is the refrigerant, it's working fluid. It's in a vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Almost all refrigeration cycles are vapor compression refrigeration, but not all. You will talk about absorption and possibly some other ones like students fall in love with uh, thermoelectric coolers, but they're not, they're not, you may have seen a, one or two of those, but the vast majority of refrigeration is done by thermal, not thermoelectric, by vapor compression. So you have a compressor and you ingest some sort of either saturated vapor or superheated vapor, and then you pass it through a condenser. And here we have two evaporators, so we can cool at certain low temperature and maybe at an intermediate temperature. Let's continue to read the problem. Saturated liquid exits the condenser at 34. So you might just put sat lick coming out of the condenser, 34 degrees C. Hey, can you tell me what is the pressure of that condenser? What's the operating pressure of that condenser? What's the pressure at three and as well as the pressure at two? Yeah, it's the saturation pressure for the temperature of 34 and for its refrigerant 134A. You could go to the tables, look that up. We'll need to do that, <laughs> okay? Um, let's continue to read the problem. The refrigerant in the evaporators are at zero C and negative 20 C. So since, which one do you think is at a lower pressure? Which one do you think is at a lower temperature? So I'm going to pause, walk around, you tell me which one's at zero, which one's at negative 20. And actually, if you have your tables, it'll be very really helpful. Tell me the pressure of the condenser, and then tell me the pressures of those two evaporators. Hands on. you got to do it. Watch me, watch me uh, solve a problem. All right. So which one is the uh, lowest temperature, evaporator one or evaporator two? Yeah, this is at negative 20 degrees C, and this one's at zero degrees C. The higher temperature has a higher pressure, and so why? Well, what, what's happening between the pressure at four as it flows through? Hey, what is this device again? Expansion valve. What about the pressure here at seven? The pressure at seven is greater than, equal to, or less than the pressure at four. It's going to be less than the pressure for it's a lower pressure hence lower temperature evaporator low pressure low temperature they, they go hand in hand okay so that's how you deduce that saturated vapor exits each evaporator so right here at this state is saturated vapor and at this state hey did they tell me state six or state five is saturated vapor which one is saturated vapor? five it, uh, it'd be easier if I assumed six was, but that's not true. So this is saturated vapor here at state five. The first evaporator has a refrigerating capacity of 0.9 tons. What? That means how much heat is being picked up, the rate at which it's being picked up is 0.9 ton. You could turn that into kilowatts. Can I uh, let you work on that for a second? How many kilowatts of cooling? The rate of cooling is 0.9 ton. I'll pause, walk around. The second evaporator, if you do that first conversion, it's easy. The second evaporator, uh, Q.2, is uh, 0.8 ton of refrigeration, and we're going to need to convert that into kilowatts as well. So Q.1 and Q.2 are given. Let's convert them into kilowatts. Okay, so uh, a, a ton of refrigeration is 211 kilojoules per minute. How many people use that? Thumbs up. Do you remember that? Good. Good job. And now we want it in kilowatts. So a minute is how many seconds? 60 seconds. So we have it right here in kilowatts. Right? Right. Okay. So that converts to being 3.165, 3.165 kilowatts of cooling, and 0.8 converts to 
813 kilowatts of cooling. Do you agree? Thumbs up if you agree. You agree? You agree? Agree? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Excellent, thank you. All right, let's continue to take a look at this. Determine the mass flow rate of the refrigerant through each of the evaporators. So what we're going to have is we're going to have M dot coming through the evaporator 1. We'll call that M dot 1. And the mass flow rate going through the second evaporator. What happens after, well, it comes out, that's M dot 2 coming out. And then what goes through this expansion valve? M dot 1 goes right through the expansion valve from 5 to 6. What happens right here? What do you, what do you, what's at that junction? What's happening? Two fluid streams mix, M-I-X. It's so the mass flow rate at 1, the mass flow rate going through this compressor, is the mass flow rate 1 plus mass flow rate 2. The mass flow rate, some of them, the, the one that went through the first evaporator plus what went through the second evaporator, they sum it up, and that's what goes through the compressor as well as through the condenser. Okay, so right away it's pretty easy, but we get our mass flow rate balances through the system. All right, now um, you're asked to calculate these mass flow rates, M.1 and M.2, how are you going to calculate M.1? What's the strategy? I want one equation. You're not going to know some of the unknowns in that equation, but that equation will allow you to calculate M.1. Write the equation down. So we do a first law analysis around the evaporator. We have one inlet, one outlet stream, and we find that the rate of heat transfer added into the working fluid going through the first evaporator is the mass flow rate going through the first evaporator times the enthalpy going out at 5 minus enthalpy 4. Now that's the first law, energy balance. Maybe it takes you three or four lines to get there. Go slow, make sure there's no error. And then you see that, oh, if I wanted to calculate this m dot, I already know the q dot in kilowatts. I need to get the, the enthalpies. So that's the name of the game. The same type of equation for the Q dot heat picked up in the second evaporator is related to the mass flow rate going through the second evaporator. The enthalpy going out, what is that? Enthalpy at 8 minus the enthalpy coming in at 7. So to solve for part A, I need the enthalpies. Just like in our vapor power cycles, gas power cycles, a lot of it boiled down to enthalpies. So, strategy for this type of problem, even before we get to part B, we get a table of properties. What do you think the table of properties, how many states you're going to have? Well, they labeled the states for us, right? And they didn't give us any efficiency of the compressor, so we don't have to worry about 2S and 2 actual. Just talk about state 2. And so, you would make a table, you say, here's my state. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And what type of information am I interested? Well, probably the pressure is very important. The temperature is very important. The quality is very important. The enthalpy at kilojoules per kilogram. And sometimes we need to use the entropy in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin to figure things out. We have to, it's what happens through the compressor. You know, it's isentropic compression. That's the information given, or there's a lack of information given, so that's the assumption we have to make. So let's do this. Does this table make sense? Let's do this. What do you think is the easiest column to figure out at this point? Let's do this. Let's fill in the temperatures and the pressures for those pieces of information that are given to us in the problem. So just put in, like, oh, they tell me negative 20 degrees C. Where is that at? All right. So um, this temperature at 8 is my saturated vapor. That's a negative 20. The temperature at, what is that, uh, 5 is uh, 0 degrees C. And my temperature at state 3 is 34. Okay. Well, it goes through this expansion valve, 
Now there's no heat transfer, no work transfer, so the temperature at 4 must be 34 degrees C because there's no heat transfer in the expansion valve. True or false? False. We're taking a refrigerant, high pressure, saturated liquid. It's going to, some of it's going to quote unquote flash on the outlet of that expansion valve because it's a low pressure. It, some of it will go into the vapor state. Some will be in the liquid state. But when it comes to a new thermal equilibrium, which it does very quickly, it will be at a low temperature. And from our experience, if you put saturated liquid in, this is probably going to be a quality of, I'm going to guess, 20%, 30%. And that pressure at 4 is the same as the pressure at 5. The temperature at 4 is equal to the temperature at 5. They're both at the saturated uh, saturation temperature. So this one at 4 is 0. A little deduction, a little thinking, thought process. Likewise, the temperature at negative at 7 is negative 20. All right. Um, how about this one? The pressure is the same through the condenser. Is the temperature at 2, 34 degrees C? Is the temperature 2, 34 degrees C? No. Typically, it's superheated vapor coming out of that compressor. And so, no, it's going to cool off, and then it's going to start to condense, all at a constant pressure. So, but what we can do is we can look up our pressures, right? We can look up our pressures uh, at that, uh, based on those temperatures. So, let's do this. What is the pressure of the condenser? What is this pressure of the condenser, which is the pressure at state 3? Isn't it 862.5 kilopascal or 8.625 bar? How many people see that in the tables? One, two, three, four, five. Good, very good. Now, how about the pressure at two? 862.5. Why is the pressure at two equal to pressure at three? Because there's no pressure drop. We neglect that in the condenser. All right, let's continue down here. How about the pressure at 5? Isn't that PSAT at 0 degrees? And when you look up PSAT at 0, isn't it 292.8? How many people find that? Good, good. And the same logic. What about the pressure for 292.8? There's negligible pressure drop through the evaporator 1. All right, same logic. We come down to state 8. We find this is around 133 kilopascal at pressure at 8. That's also the pressure at 7, 133.0 kilopascal. There's two pressures that I want you to think about and work on. I want you to tell me, I'll walk around that pressure at 6, and I want you to tell me, and I'll walk around the pressure at 1. So what we figure out is this is 133 because this pressure at, at 8 mixes with the pressure at 6 and also at 1. These all have to be the same pressure. So this is 133. That's a lot to work right there at getting all our pressures. We didn't start by getting our pressures. We just started by putting in a couple temperatures and then went through the logic. Now... Uh, this temperature at 6 and the temperature at 2 and the temperature at 1. Somebody might think, oh, I think I can figure them out. Well, you may not be able to. Let's take a look at it. The temperature at 6 is after that expansion valve. It actually is going to be close to the temperature at 5, but it won't be exactly the same, will it? Nope. Nope. The, pressure, the temperature at 1 is the combination of 6 and, and 8, but we don't know it. We, we'll calculate it, but at this point, we have to, we can't calculate it directly. We have to basically go H's and S's. We need to work on other parts of the table. All right, maybe, uh, so lead pause right there. We don't, we can't figure out more of these temperatures. We'll come back to them after we work with quality and enthalpy and entropy. So, how about this? What 
quality values can you put into the table? Well, you could put in there where it's saturated liquid. Saturated liquid is state what? Is that a quality of zero? Yeah, that's saturated liquid. How about saturated vapor? States five and state eight. And that's quality of one and 100%. Did I do that right? Do we know any other qualities? Not really, we have to work to get them. Okay, um, how about the H's? Enthalpies. Can you get the enthalpy at state, saturated liquid at state three? Yeah, that will be H of F at to 34 degrees C. How many people already looked up H of F at 34 degrees C? What value do you get? 97.3. One, four digits on it, perfect, thank you very much. That's one of the H's. You could probably get the H down here, H of G at zero degrees C. That's at state what? Five, uh, five. isn't that 247.23? And then our other H is H at eight. H of G at negative 20 degrees C, and that comes in 235.31. You agree? Thank you very much. Any other confirmations? Thank you very much. All right, now I have three of those H values. Hmm, should I pause and let you work on seeing about figuring out some of these other H values? Like, uh, do you think you could figure out H of four? What's the H4 equal to? Let me pause, walk around. You tell me what H4 is. Just by knowing. <laughs> Professor, in these problems, it sure would be easier if you just sort of started in the top right corner and worked through the system. No, sorry. That's just not the way it is. We're kind of bouncing around. You're deducing things and putting it into the table. When we evaluate this, uh, this expansion valve right here, we find its isenthalpic flow through the expansion valve. Hence, H4 is equal to H3, so we can write that in, that this is 97.31. We look at this expansion valve down here. It's isenthalpic, so from 4 to 7, it's the same H, so H7 is 97.31. And then we look at this expansion valve from 5 to 6. We're good. We're on a run with the expansion valves. And so H6 is uh, 247.23, the same as H5. That makes sense? Good. We've got a lot of values figured out, don't we? Only thing we have to figure out is what's the H at 1 and H at 2. Well, do you have enough information to calculate the M.1 at this point in your life? Yes, and you can. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase right here. And I'm going to say you can now solve. You didn't fill out the whole table, did you? But to get the answer for H1, we have to know M.1 and M.2. So we go now and we calculate M.1. We calculate M.1, it's like 0 0.0211 kilograms per second. And the mass flow rate through the second evaporator comes in at 0 0.0204 kilograms per second. Now knowing M.1 and M.2, and knowing what happens right here, what happens right there? It's mixing, M-I-X. We have an inlet, an inlet, and one outlet. Can you tell me what H1 is? What's the enthalpy at state 1? My diagram may be too confusing, too cluttered up. All right. So what we do is we do an energy balance around this mixing where you have two inlets and one outlet. And I'm going to erase this equation just for room. You have that on your notes. And don't we have the mass flow rate at 1 coming in with its enthalpy at state 6 plus the mass flow rate through the second evaporator 
coming in with its enthalpy at 8 equal to what goes out. That's the combination of 1 and 2. We already knew that from a mass balance point of view. And the enthalpy going out at state 1. One equation, one unknown. The only one unknown is H1. And then you'll find that H1 is some fraction uh, that goes through the evaporator 1 times H6 plus some fraction that goes through the second evaporator H8. I like to pause. Maybe this is 50-50. Maybe this is 90-10. Maybe it's 10%, 90%. You know, I like to look at those fractions to, to stop me from making an error. But when I make the calculation, we find that H1 comes in at 241.37. Yes, you need to know the mass flow rates. Because it, they, they basically give you a weighted average of those two enthalpies. All right, now, at this point, you have to analyze the compressor. So you do the first law, the second law around that compressor. You've done enough compressors. There's no isentropic efficiency. So what I think is S1 is equal to S2. How in the world am I going to get S1? How am I going to get S1? I'm going to pause and let you tell me how you get S1. And then you set S2 equal to S1. And then you can finish the analysis of the compressor. How do you find S1? Yeah, so to find S1, you basically say, I'm going to look up the property called entropy, knowing two intensive independent properties. In this case, I know the pressure at 1 and the enthalpy at 1. Voila. Hey, what is that principle called? Isn't it called the state principle? In thermodynamics, we have simple compressible substances. And those substances, uh, they, they end up having a state principle in the sense that if I want another intensive property, if I just find two independent intensive properties, I can look it up. Most of the time, we like to think of getting maybe uh, enthalpy as a function of temperature and pressure. Maybe entropy is a function of temperature and pressure. Our favorite two independent intensive properties are temperature and pressure, but they don't always have to be temperature and pressure. And then the curveball comes in thermodynamics and say, well, maybe you know this one and that one. Maybe you know pressure and enthalpy. Go and get S. Aren't you glad you mastered Thermo 1? Isn't the state principle described in either like chapter 1 of the textbook or chapter 2 of the textbook? And then how to evaluate properties given these two, but not that one, blah, blah, blah. Isn't that like chapter three? That's what it is. I'm sorry? Well, they have to be independent properties. So when you're in a two-phase region, is pressure and temperature independent? No. That's why the quality kicks in. So it was like the temperature and the quality was known at state uh, 5. That gives us the H of F and that. So, okay, so uh, this is a little bit of work. Maybe it requires interpolation, double interpolation, 0. 0.95742. So now we 0. 0.95742. How am I going to get the enthalpy coming out of the compressor at state 2 now? How do we do that? I'm going to pause. You tell me. How do you get the enthalpy at state 2? Exactly the state principle again. So we find the enthalpy at 2. Enthalpy is a function of two independent intensive properties. We know the pressure at 2, and we know the entropy at 2. S2 is equal to S1. And now, I'm not saying that interpolation is easy either. But uh, you kind of do a little round robin up there on your property table, and you can get that this is 281.64. At this point, if you're interested, you don't need to know. If you're interested, you can get the temperature at 1, the temperature at 2, the temperature at 6. Actually, you could have done that earlier. Basically, the temperature at 6 is a function. Now, I must need to write something here. 
let me just erase right in here. If you wanted to, they're not saying you need to. You could have said the temperature is six is the temperature, knowing what two properties, the pressure at six and the enthalpy at six. You could, that's fair game, all right? Um, and then the temperature at one is equal to the temperature uh, as a function of pressure of one and the uh, enthalpy at one and the temperature at two is a function of the pressure at two and entropy at two. All right. Well, once I have that, I'm asked to calculate the net power input to the cycle for part B. How do I calculate the net power input to the cycle? I'm going to erase this and express that solution right in here. So my net power, W dot net, into the cycle. There's only one place it comes in. It's into the compressor. So it's the mass flow rate going through the compressor, 1 plus M dot 2 times the H going out of the compressor, H2, minus the inlet enthalpy, H1. And we can calculate that. It turns out to be about 1.67 kilowatts. W dot into the compressor, about 1.67 kilowatts. All right. Ready to press forward? Well, um, might as well show you how to look up properties using software. So um, this is a, a site that I've recommended to a number of students over the years. It's, 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 in, it's in Excel. It's an add-in to Excel. And you're able to evaluate thermodynamic fluid properties. And so all you do is in a, a Google search, just type in Excel in mechanical engineering or something like that. It goes to University of Alabama website. In the Alabama website, you can go and uh, read it and they have thermodynamic software, heat transfer th software, some other software. Here is some instructions on how to download thermodynamic tables. This is Excel add-in and how to do the add-in. It's not that hard. So, um, would you like me to demo this software? Because what you can do is set it up in Excel and it's nice and neat just like you did by hand you have this many states you have the pressures and the temperatures you're working through the system <coughs> not always just kind of going from this corner down or that corner down no sometimes you have to you know okay i i know 34 i know zero and i know negative 20. put those in and then oh Get the saturation, pressure, saturation, pressure, saturation, pressure. Find that there's three pressures and percolate the rest of the pressure column, etc. Yes, sir. Yep, it is. I'm going to show that next. So, um, these are the numbers. Now, look at using the numbers in our tables in the back of the appendix, you don't get the exact same values as the software out there grabbed from some website. Why? Well, it, it's like the people have manufactured the refrigerants. These are manufactured uh, fluids. And then they make some measurements and they correlate them and they put together some algorithms to evaluate entropy as a function of pressure and enthalpy, etc. And so it's not, it's not perfect. Okay? I mean, when you look at the properties of water, it's pure, clean water, not mixed with anything. And those have great agreement over the years worked out. But refrigerants, they're a little less um, perfect. So these numbers are slightly different. Slightly different than the numbers that we just talked about. Using the tables in the appendix and doing the interpolation in the tables in the appendix. Okay. Should I demo this or not? I can come back to it. Uh, in Excel, uh, I don't know if you've ever used the control tilde. Hold the control button down, hit the tilde, and it will flip you to expose your underlying equations. And so here it is. It's like uh, I typed in negative 20. I typed in 34. And then I said PSAT. 
as an underscore T, that's the call, that's the algorithm, for refrigerant 134A. And here you can see I was doing it where I'm actually uh, got a separate set of uh, algorithms. It's, it's like in table A10 of the textbook. And given then this cell right here. The formula is a little too long. And then uh, you can see some other things. It's how it's worked out. And then, oh, just go copy what's in cell C5. C5, it just copied that pressure. And then copy what's in cell C10. It just copied what's this pressure right there. Um, how many people have used Excel? All right. I don't, is your hand up? Have you used Excel? Okay. Have you used Excel? You've never used it? You probably want to team up with somebody and get exposed to it before you get into senior design, probably. I'm surprised. It's not taught in the curriculum anywhere, is it? But students use it. Faculty even use it. I use it. So I don't mind showing it, but in the interest of time, most students are bored. So these are using the textbook properties. I think I showed you the... Uh, the code, and here are the values for the textbook. They're like slightly different. These are the ones we just talked through. All right. Well, uh, what about this RefProp? I've exposed you to RefProp. Some of you have downloaded it. And so what we can do here, and you do have that uh, numbers and et cetera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch mm -hmm. over, and I'm going to go ahead and demo ref prop for this problem. So we come out to the software. I have it like right over here on the, so we open it up. And uh, yeah, we're using a version. So uh, options, units. Um, I like degree C. If it's not degree C, change it. I like kilopascal. If it's not there, change it. If you get to a set of units you like, you can actually tell them to set this as your default, and, but uh, that's okay. We'll just say okay, and then we have to get our substance. It's a pure fluid, and it's not on, like a lot of fluids here, right? But 134A right here, right? Now, student version, you get a, a handful of these. And then a reference state, properties. I like to get the temperature, the pressure, uh, we don't really need density or specific volume. We don't need internal energy. We need enthalpy. We need entropy. We need quality. So you have to look for sometimes for quality. It's way over here. Uh, you could use joule, get the joule Thompson, compressibility factor, speed of sound. There's a lot here in the software. And then if you wanted to, you could come down to special and get the flow exergy if you wanted to do exergetic analysis of the system. But we didn't, so I'm not going to do it here. And just go back. There's transport. I think I've showed this to you. Just a lot of properties. All right. And then I like to put them in order in my table like I like them. So I like pressure first. But if you didn't, move pressure down. So I have temperature, then pressure. Uh, but I like to put pressure first, then temperature, then quality. Now, because I didn't select density or specific volume or internal energy, they're in the order, but they're not going to be shown. But then I'm going to get H and S. I'm not going to show CV, CP, blah, blah, blah. So all of these. But you can move them around, up and down, move to the top, etc. So here's that's the order of properties in the table. If I wanted to, I could do some other things. But let's do this. Let's. We already selected our fluid. And we want to basically calculate. And here at this point, your set specified states. Now, this is always tricky. It's like state one, uh, you have the combination of doing it by hand and then going into the table and evaluate property. But uh, maybe I just put in some filler. I say it, it's uh, 100 kilopascal and 100 degrees, whoops, and 100 degrees C because it won't allow me to, to start working at state three. Uh, so 100 kilopascal, or 1,000, what do I type in? And then put 100. Now I'm finally at state 3. Wasn't state 3 where they told me it's a 34 degrees C? 
and it's saturated liquid. What's the quality? Saturated liquid. Finally, I have some numbers that are good. And there's my pressure. There's my enthalpy. Oh, this makes it too easy. That's why I don't show it to you at the first day of class, right? Show it to you later after you've developed the skill to know if these look reasonable or not. And then what was state five? State five was um, uh, pressure and enthalpy. Um, so we're going to drop the pressure. We already know what the pressure is, but I'm going to skip it for, for right now. I'm going to say 100 and uh, put 100. We can come back and improve those. But now state uh, five, we knew that it was zero degrees and it was saturated vapor, wasn't it? That allows us to get pressure at five. The pr if I copy this pressure, put it up here, paste it, now I'm ready to really calculate state four. So it's the pressure that I know and the enthalpy, copy this enthalpy right there and put paste it right there, and boom. So now it's saying, oh, it's coming in at 23, 24% quality. By mass, it's, it's flashed. 24% by mass is in the vapor state. The rest is ready to provide cooling. Yes, sir? Well, because this is software, and it's slightly different. Now, if I go back to the reference states back here in the options and that, and I can um, try to change the, the reference states. Now, these aren't that far off, but sometimes they'll be much more far off because the reference state's been shifted for one textbook or one piece of software. So uh, that's a very good point when you start your property evaluations from one source, don't mix and match, especially for refrigerants. Stay in that source for the whole calculation, for the whole table, because it'll you'll get errors. Yeah. All right. Now, what about state six? State six was, <coughs> excuse me, is um, after expansion valve. I think I'm just going to put in something. We know the pressure at six, right? Isn't that What's the pressure at six? No, we don't know it yet. I just put a hundred and a hundred. Using ref prop, you really have to know if you want to keep the numbering of the states consistent. You really have to know how to manipulate it, like I'm doing. All right, so we'll come back to state six in a minute. What about state seven? Same thing. I really don't know the pressure yet. And then now, finally, it's for state eight. Its temperature is negative 20, and it's a superheated vapor, or not superheated, saturated vapor, quality one. Now, I know the pressure. So I copy that pressure. I go back to state seven, and I say the pressure there, and the pressure and the enthalpy, the enthalpy at state uh, seven was the same as the enthalpy at state three. So I come up here to enthalpy state three, um, hold it. What do I have here? 34, 0, Let me go ahead and copy that. Copy. Come down here. Do a paste. And what's the quality? About 34%, right? Okay. So it looks like states 8, 7, did I fix state 6? No, state 6, what is state 6? Is I know this low pressure at state 6. Okay. And what else do I know about state 6? It's enthalpy at state 5 is equal to enthalpy. Copy, paste. Superheated vapor, you can check that temperature at state 6. All right. Now, what about the enthalpy at state uh, and the pressure? Let's do the pressure at state one. Isn't that my low pressure? Yeah. And now this is where you have to go off on the side and calculate. What is my mass flow rate? Blah, 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 blah. So um, in the interest of time, let me just uh, 
Oh, man. Let me just t type in some values here. So you would go out, you would calculate, oh, my enthalpy is 392.51, I believe. And it comes like this. And then now I know the entropy. I copy that down. And my pressure, I finally know. Put that up. And now it's superheated vapor, and that's the temperature. So it's just like you did it by hand in the tables in the software you're doing it. Okay, now I can come over here and I can plot information. Let's put it on a TS diagram. What's valuable about the RefProp is you can make good plots. Now, I'm just going to say I'm going to plot from a pressure of 2,000 to a pressure of 8,000 by a pressure increment of 6,000, which means I'm just going to have two pressure lines on there, two isobars. I've done this a few times to make it work. It's a little clumsy, sorry. Okay, and then um, the, the, the uh, x-axis is entropy. I'm going to plot from uh, 0.75 to 2, which is good, and then the temperature I'm going to plot from negative 50. I've played with it. I know what I want to do before I come in and show you to about 100 degrees C. Now, if I connect the saturation states, it'll draw flat lines in the dome. If I don't, it won't show the flat lines in the dome. So I know there's more to look at and investigate, but it's a temperature entropy diagram. There's my 2,000, 8,000. There's one line going through the dome. All right. Now, what I want to do is I want to go back to the plot and uh, the temperature entropy plot. And uh, I can modify the plot, I believe. Mm, no, I don't want to do that. Cancel. I want to do this. I want to go back to a plot. Let's do a temperature entropy diagram. We have all these pressures. I want to click more. This is one of the most awkward things, like more what? I don't know. Click there and find out. All right, so now if you want to put in a pressure line that corresponds to some of our pressures of the um, coming out of the compressor, what was that? 862, 862 kilopascal. And then the first evaporator, 293. The second, 133. You click OK. Now that's my lowest intermediate and that's out of the compressor so I have my three pressure lines on there all of my states now are on those three lines all eight states okay now what you can do is you can do an overlay uh, overlay plot believe me it takes a while to figure all this out but what do you want to overlay well we have specified state points in a table I don't want to put them in a line. Don't put no line there. Put a symbol, something like a, a, a round circle, and make it really different colors so I can see it. And so we're going to overlay that onto this plot. And there you go. So uh, coming out of the compressor is probably the easiest one. That was the hardest last one to calculate. But it's at this high pressure, and it's superheated vapor. That's state two. It's then cooled cooled what comes out is state three it's saturated liquid on a temperature entropy it goes through an expansion valve down to four and then it comes over to that evaporator to five you continue the expansion valve from four down to seven seven over to eight now this is where it gets a little tricky <coughs> Because from 5, you go to an expansion valve to 6. It's at that low pressure. You mix 6 with 8. It's going to have the kind of a, a low entropy, high entropy. It's a mass. Uh, I know there's some entropy generation, but you get, you get this state right here, which is state 1 going into the compressor. We said our compressor was isentropic. It's straight up on a TS diagram to state two. That's the value of some software like this. Really shows you where these states are. Makes sense? Okay, well, let's do this. I want to introduce you to another plot. 
We like pressure enthalpy plots. Why? Because a lot of times going through the valves, it's isenthalpic. And we have only three unique pressures in this, in this uh, vapor compression refrigeration system. So uh, set up the pressure enthalpy plot. Well, okay, uh, for the pressure enthalpy plot, um, you play with it a little bit, but for the, the uh, different temperature lines, w let's just pick, uh, um, you can do it like this, negative 20 to 0 by increment of 20. Well, that's going to put two values of temperature lines on this pressure enthalpy plot. Okay, another one that we wanted was about a negative 6. Why is that? Go back and look at our uh, values and our tables. I, I have to, I should have shown you, but let me finish this out. And 34 and 49. 49. Those are unique temperatures. How about the range of enthalpy? We don't need it to go from 70 to 700. Let's pick about 150 to about 450. Again, I've played with this before coming in. Otherwise, you would just kind of repeat and do a couple of them. And then go from the y-axis, maybe uh, 80, up to about 2,000. 2,000. Connect saturation states, agree. Let's see what it looks like. So this is pressure. This is enthalpy. Make sense? What are these lines? They're constant temperature. This line comes across at the high temperature of 49. Why did I pick 49? Come back here, and what is it coming out of the compressor at? 49 degrees C. So we knew it was around 49 degrees C. Come back over here and say, why 34? Well, that's coming out of the condenser. A zero degree C, that was one of our evaporators. Now, why negative 6? Because when we do the mixing, it's about negative 6. Negative 5, maybe I should have picked negative 5 instead of that. All right? Okay. So now we have our pressure enthalpy diagram. You can do the same thing. You can overlay the plot. When you do the overlay of the plot, here's my points. No line. Put a symbol. Make it red so I can see it. Hit OK. And here is state coming out of the condenser. What is that state? 3. Isenthalpic. Isenthalpic. 3 to 4. 3 uh, and then 4 to 7. This is state 8 out of the evaporator. This the lowest temperature one. State, what, 5 out of the evaporator. But then when it went through that other expansion valve, it went straight down. And you could see, maybe I should have put negative, what, 5 instead of negative 6. It doesn't lay right on that negative 6 line. But when we mix these two streams, you come in with the temperature right around here, put it through a compressor, it comes up to state, so state 1 up to state um, 2, out of the compressor. Then it's going to cool at constant pressure from 49 degrees C to 34, and then 34, it's going to condense. That's a pretty hard plot to generate. Hopefully, um, that makes sense to you. So this software, um, I'd like to show it to you. It's a really nice software. These are the values that I calculated before. Hopefully, I didn't mess up. Hopefully, they're the same that I just showed you. And uh, this is that temperature entropy plot with then the putting of the states on and the pressure enthalpy plot with the states on. All right. You find that helpful? Okay, well, hope so.